think I called this a little self-indulgent the first time I saw it, but you know, regardless of your feelings in the MCU, they've created something that goes beyond the comics at this point. I've got no problem with them commemorating these amazing films and talented people. Now we know where Star-Lord gets his taste in color schemes. Alright, I'm blown away. I can almost guarantee there are some kids born after the millennium that don't even know that's a digitally de-aged Kurt Russell. I thought that maybe it was the glasses and that he wasn't talking, but hot dang, there are no cracks. There's no uncanny valley. I'm actually creeped out that I'm not creeped out. And let's talk about how ingenious the casting of Kurt Russell is. If you wanted a man's man sex icon from the 80s, you need look no further than Snake Plissken, or RJ McCready, or Jack Burton, or Dean Prophet. You get that last one without IMDb-ing it, and you've got my undying respect. Showtime, a-holes! Series continuity. He did admit that in the last film, even if he's not- 100% a dick. Touchdown! So one of the main things I praised about the first film was this inconsequential tone, and I'm ecstatic to see Gunn keep that going. Cold open, get you excited battle against a rainbow fire-breathing squid starlack shark beast? Let's watch Baby Groot dance and ride around in an Orloni instead. James Gunn's direction tells its own story. Pay attention, fools, we're on Earth in the 80s. Now it's later. Go ahead, try not to love my style. I am Groot. Hey, we're not looking at you funny. I'm sure it comes as no surprise to anyone that Baby Groot is my wife's favorite this time around. You guys had a lot of good suggestions for what to call this type of win. This one from Jillemeister was probably my favorite, but for the sake of brevity, I'll stick with the consensus. Groot's a wife win. Viewers in the future who haven't seen this video prepare to be confused every time I use that. Did the camera just run into Baby Groot? Was the fourth wall just broken? But I do need to say that the lax tone is only tone. The dancing sequence is actually one long take and clearly took a lot of work to put together. And don't worry, there's still some sweet slow-mo action. That's a really short callback. I thought your thing was a sword. We've been hired to stop an interdimensional beast from feeding on those batteries, and I'm gonna stop it with a sword. There's a cut on its neck! Rocket! Get it to look up! And some early teamwork, even if everyone's not always paying attention. I have single-handedly vanquished the beast! Perhaps someday you could give me a history lesson in the archaic ways of our ancestors for academic purposes. Ah, uh, uh, flirting? Family reunion, yay! Have I mentioned that I thank God for Chris Pratt? Also, Chris Pratt's workout routine. There are two types of beings in the universe. Those who dance, and those who do not. Mm -hmm. So Groot could be just being cute and calling back to the post credits scene of Volume 1, or does he show a fundamental understanding about what Drax would respect? And obviously my wife still loves Rocket as well. Ha! <laughs> perfect. Turning this intense life and death space battle into a high-end looking multi-tier arcade. You suck, Zylak. Typical. Complete with haters. Well, I like this. A little one-inch man saved us. Well, if he got closer, I'm sure he'd be much larger. Forced perspective jokes. Appropriately egg-shaped ship for the guy trying to spread his DNA all over the world. And they even exit through the yoke. You know what they say, you're out of luck until you've gone duck. Yeah, I don't think anyone's ever said that. But if you really want to remake Howard the Duck, I will only watch it if you can convince Seth MacFarlane, Dan Harmon, Justin Rowland, Matt Groening, and obviously Seth Green, and maybe the other robot chicken guys to make it. Fair? Otherwise, don't bother. For some of the audience, I could see the leap from the end of the first film's Yondu to the end of this film's Yondu hard to swallow. But his intro in this film is very cleverly shirtless and extremely vulnerable. And we get to sympathize with him right away by seeing the judge come down on him really hard, even if Dredd pronounces law wrong. You betrayed the code! Must be Emma Frost's brother. Yeah, I, I know it's Martin X. What do you mean, Lex Luthor? That's Lex Luthor from Smallville? Last time these guys met, Rooker had a lot more hair hanging off those cliffs. Uh, yeah, that was him. More importantly, notice Starhawk says, Ravagers don't deal in kids! Hinting at what Ego was really doing. Seems he's going soft. If he's so soft, why are you whispering for? Standing up for your captain to old Phaser Trace. You best. Be very careful what you say about our captain. And Chibs was always loyal to the right guys. Even where I reside, out past the edge of what's known, we've heard tell about the man they call Star-Lord. That's all he ever wanted. So like, wish fulfillment and name recognition. What are you doing? Smiling. Smiling. Listen, if he ends up being evil, we'll just kill him. Planet's implosion shadowing. I love this unspoken parental connection they all have with Groot. Gives the feeling of time spent together without actually recounting all of their adventures. Even in the first battle, they're all looking out for him. Man, does James Gunn understand how to use music? 
I don't care how many slow-mo hero walks you throw at me, set them to Fleetwood Mac and I'm on board. Not even mentioning how fitting the lyrics are. And if you ever questioned it, know that he writes the script in tandem with song choices which are from his list of Meredith Quill songs. Sometimes even picking the song first. I think they have something to do with my empathic ability. If I touch someone, I can feel their feelings. So like Deanna Troy with Antennae combined with a less angry arrow? Romantic. Sexual love. No, no, I don't. For her. No. <laughs> Discretion. <laughs> Touch me, and the only thing you're gonna feel is a broken jaw. Candidness. He lies awake at night thinking about his progeny. Yeah, familial genocide could be tough on the soul. Progenocide? <laughs> Face starts. The reason these effects work so well is the mix of practical and CG elements. Rocket's obviously CGI, but they shot plates of the forest and the explosions in the trees are mostly practical. It's so tough now without all your toys, are you? You had to ask. See, someone from Earth wouldn't question the merciless savagery of an intelligent self-aware raccoon. I would know to run the other direction. But Ravagers are sort of dumb anyway, so their stupidity is forgiven. That ain't right! I just gotta say it this one time, Captain. No matter how many times Quill betrays you, you protect him! I almost have this feeling that Kurt, or Kraglin, or whatever, James Gunn's brother, and the mocap for Rocket and Groot, which, side note, you thought he was busy in the first film. Oh, uh, where was I? Right, I have a feeling that he was actually just hedging his bets since the writing was on the wall with a razor base over there or whatever, especially considering this. I knew he got that newer, bigger, more comic-accurate fin, but I didn't expect him to get shot in the head to need it. Dang. It's not ripe. I'm not saying James Gunn is definitely a Rick and Morty fan. I'm not even saying that Rick and Morty invented Comedy movies, comes in threes. But... It's not ripe. It's not ripe. It's not ripe. So I'm still winning the acknowledgement of the rule. Side note, check out Wisecrack if you love Rick and Morty as much as me. And that's been your Cinema Wins YouTube public service announcement for the week. Goodness gracious. I generally like to save these establishing shots for my conclusion, but how gorgeous is this shot? James Gunn, the DP, Henry Brom, and everyone that worked on the visual effects, you are all amazing. Really wanna see I also love their use of non-verbal foreshadowing through things like the lyrics of background songs. Ego hasn't revealed his god status yet, and all of Ego's floors have the appearance of root system just like he planted his roots throughout the galaxy. What? He actually planted things with roots. I too am extraordinarily humble. Humility. I'm what's called a celestial sweetheart. I said I wanted a celestial movie. Not exactly what I had in mind, but I'll take what I can get. I don't know. If this guy I just met had an entire room dedicated to explaining his backstory with PS2 visuals, I might question, number one, to have such a detailed and thorough setup, how many times has he done this? Which leads me to number two, why is he still alone? And that's all answered shortly. I like that his motivations are always sketchy to us, even if Peter gets a little blinded. And if you watch Mantis throughout, what you may have at first mistaken for timidity or subservience is actually uneasiness hearing all the Eagles' lies for the thousandth time. Even for Ravagers, that's cold. To rise once again to glory with a new captain! Lasers in space? Anyone else get a distinct A Bicyclops Built for Two vibe from Ego's plan? You know, the one where Leela and all the women with the different numbers of eyes get duped by that chameleon guy? They managed to somehow create a goofy callback scene that still feels heartfelt, but still goofy at the same time. I'll also say I see this as the first hint of how malicious Ego's actions are. Of course his god mode status allows him to eavesdrop so on Gamora sad. and Peter's conversation in the woods. As a kid, I used to see all the other kids off playing catch with their dad, and I, I wanted that. So that he could easily fulfill that little fantasy of Peter's. You are horrifying to look at, yes. But that's a good thing. Oh? Uh? When you're ugly and someone loves you, you know they love you for who you are. So then, compliments? Max. There's something I must tell you. So you might be asking yourself, after all these years with Ego watching him do his evil thing, why would she decide now to warn these people? Well, there's actually a deleted scene where she talks about never having come across beings that felt so much love. I think that this moment encapsulates that visually. Drax's breadth of emotion hits her like a truck. You get the feeling that these are new experiences for her. Hey, what about this little plant? Can I smash it with a rock? No, Chef. It's too adorable to kill. Accurate. Why didn't you deliver Quill to Ego like you promised? He was skinny. Good for Steven. Now you might be thinking, why lie to Rocket? Just say Ego's a homicidal maniac. Well, that would show that Yondu cared for something or someone other than himself. And he's not there yet. Definitely not with Rocket. My wife says that this is Groot at maximum cuteness. I don't disagree. I think she really just wants to hug him and make it all better. Probably doesn't hurt that he somehow reminds us of Jude. Side note, I need to retract what I said about my friend who doesn't like Chris Pratt. She does actually like him as an actor, she just doesn't think he's as fiery hot as I do. I know, crazy, right? But she did give baby Jude this baby Groot, so really all is forgiven. 
And apparently some people thought this scene was thrown in as filler to stretch runtime, and to that I say... <sighs> A baby Groot failing to retrieve the new Finn montage is the fastest way to get sort of good guys to condone appendage amputation. Tell me you guys have a refrigerator somewhere with a bunch of severed human toes. Okay, then let's just agree to never discuss this. <laughs> I love that Groot just has no clue what's going on around him. Whoa, why is he punching himself? Oh, now I'm up here. He was never going to find the Finn. Another ironic song choice amidst all the red shirt slang. And what an amazingly shot scene. Gun implemented a variable speed slow motion dynamic where different speed shots are layered on top of each other. It gives the entire set piece an extremely unique feel. It really conveys the disconnect or remote control feeling between Yondu and his arrow and ramps up his power. <laughs> Gert's not yelling just to scare this guy. He's reminding him of how he was treated. <laughs> And if anyone had it coming, Dave Fowler, the sadistic jarhead, had it coming. <laughs> well, now he should go by Blazer Carcase. Carcass, car carcass. Was that the Warcraft opening? Grona, you down there? No? How about Cork? No? Already on Sakaar? I've gotta give Guns Riding some credit for this relationship. Their flirtation and infatuation was pretty much based on appearances and the adrenaline rush of circumstances of the first film. This time, we get quiet moments with them. Just the simple fact that she's quickly willing to dance with them this time around is beautiful. The most telling is that it's Gamora who convinces Peter to take a leap and trust his father because she actually knows him and understands his yearning for a father. What if this man is your Hasselhoff? Now we get to one of my favorite sequences. No score, no 70s music, just the silence of the desert created by Gamora's intolerance of Ego's plant life broken by a Ravager ship tearing through the atmosphere. Psychopath. <laughs> I love the implication that this is just another one of their sparring sessions, revealing how brutal they are. And it's such a revealing moment in Flip of who's actually the good guy. It becomes clear that Nebula is actually the more emotional and vulnerable of the two sisters. And Karen Gillian really proves her merit in this scene. I don't need to tell you what you want, it's obvious! You were the one who wanted to win, and I just wanted a sister! You think Gert's puke could have saved Tony from Palladium Poisoning? Push away anyone who's willing to put up with you, cause just a little bit of love reminds you how big and empty that hole inside you actually is. It isn't until Yondu has spent some time with Rocket that he really starts to open up to him as he sees a mirror of himself and his own fear of intimacy in Rocket. Great moment of softening Yondu further and diving further into the why of Rocket. I know who you are, boy, because you're me. Until everything is. Me. You do remove moral ambiguity when your baddie wants to impregnate the universe. But of course he does. Marvel gods are rarely benevolent. It broke my heart to put that tumor in her head. What? Appropriate response. Totally. Huge fan of the lack of hesitation. Give my mom a tumor, you die. And yeah, even if you look like Michael Knight. But this is the evidence from before. It's all just been to seduce Peter. And I love that Ego thought he had him. It's a statement about Celestials and about humanity. Almost a test to see if Peter was really accepting the reality of the situation and putting emotion aside the way Ego clearly has done numerous times. Cause, you know, rule the universe and stuff. Ah, the dolly zoom. It surprisingly came up in Kung Fu Panda 2, which I wrote after this, so I didn't want to repeat myself, and this example has way more meaning and impact. Anyway, the dolly zoom. Hitchcock invented it for Vertigo, but you probably recognize it from Jaws. It's a combination of zooming in with the lens of the camera while physically moving the camera away from the subject. Here it isolates Peter and almost gives an instant feeling of nausea like the truth of his mother's death came crashing down on his face. Quality technique. In an old piece of construction equipment Yandu once used to slice open the bank of Ascavaria. Hey, so Peter was actually telling the truth to that Kree girl who tried to rip out his thorax. It was all for the heist. Well, of course I have issues! <laughs> That's my freaking father! Self-reflection? One more completely incongruent song for an armada of death appearing. It's so refreshing. When your auditory expectations are subverted, you actually end up more engaged in what's happening. And our fat butts ain't gonna fit through those tiny holes. Well... That's a terrible idea. Honesty. I am Groot. Mm -hmm. I am Groot. Uh-huh. I am Groot. No, that's exactly <laughs> what you just said! How is that even possible? Yeah, Scott's tape would work. Then why did you ask me if stunt tape would work if you don't have any? This is it. It was the standing in a circle scene last film, this time it's the tape inquisition. It's long enough that you start, stop, and then start laughing again. And you'd be hard pressed to land at this well without Bradley Cooper and Chris Pratt. 
Electra teamwork. Hell yeah, he's cool. I'm man popping, y'all! Self-acceptance? You can never go wrong with a circling around the hero shot, especially when you undercut it with a rock to the head. Mantis, look out! Helpfulness. And props to Tyler Bates. In a film filled with amazing music, his score stands out when it's called to. Saving your sister. Sometimes the middle of third act sections can drag and can have super confusing timelines and geographies. But each section, starting with the Eagles crushing and Peter's rescue to their travel to the core and battle with the Sovereign, has a very different aesthetic to once they're in and trying to blow the planet up. We're kept intrigued by an ever-changing landscape and color palette. And it's risky to have your main antagonist disappear or only appear in new forms for long stretches, but it really works. Stay back! Is not what is that? Yeah, we don't really know. You should ask your son, though. He directed it. Never a more accurate representation of the idiot masses. What looks and acts like sentient blue lava just shut up out of the ground, rubbernecking humans stand around it not even an hour later instead of, I don't know, being anywhere else on the planet. Give me an entire movie built around this one shot. Ugh, you hope they'll come back to Fleetwood Mac, but you think, nah, they used it to signify that Rocket may never really love Peter, and that's all we'll get. But, ooh, then they come back and clarify that indeed, not even Ego can break the chain as Peter chooses his true family over his biological one. Ugh, good stuff. And I love this quieting of the mayhem that's going on around them taking a huge moment and shrinking it down to Peter's own experiences until Fleetwood Mac crashes back in. Grandpa Quill. We'll get ready for an 800-foot statue of Pac-Man with Skeletor and Heather Locklear. Do you want? All right, so we got Skeletor, we got Pac-Man, we even got the Hoth. So where's Heather Locklear? Also, just come on. Who hasn't wished to see Pac-Man eat a giant Kurt Russell? If you don't enjoy that, we can't be friends. If you kill me, you'll be just like everybody else. Maybe. Maybe he's telling the truth. He's been pushing that agenda since the beginning. Peter has no reason not to believe him, so his powers vanish. I'm just saying he may be lying. Just because he drew his power from his planet doesn't mean Peter does. I'm just saying it might come in handy against Thanos. Come up it's. He may have been your father, boy, but he wasn't your daddy. I'm damn lucky you, my boy. Self-sacrifice. What a gut-wrenching scene to have your real dad finally reach out to you only to show you unconditional love by choosing your life over his. Amazing performance from both men. And if you're wondering why Quill didn't just use his face mask, Ego broke it. I can't say for sure whether Gunn had this ending in mind when he wrote volume one, but it sure feels like it. The misdirect at the ending of that film now has a renewed meaning. Yondu had to know the troll was in the orb and his smile at the end is really telling. Thing you're searching for your whole life. It's right there by your side all along. You don't even know it. A little triple meaning in there. Peter and Yondu, Gamora and Nebula, and you could probably stretch it to Gamora and Peter. I am good. He did call you Twig. <laughs> Gert still literally has no idea what's going on. I will help them by killing Thanos. I don't know if that's possible. You should see if the Avengers want to help. I think they might. Hugging. I know that James Gunn really wanted this film to be visually distinct from volume one, and he definitely accomplished that. The word that comes to mind is rainbow. It's called a Zune. It's what everybody's listening to on Earth nowadays. It's got 300 songs on it. 300 songs? Uh, only thing is they're all in Russian. Okay, see you later, Pan. What a song. Cat Stevens is always a win. My father and I actually bonded over this song, so it got me good. And it serves another double meaning. Peter's sadness over losing Yondu gets replaced by the realization that he's been failing Groot much in the same way. This look on Groot's face is the moment that Peter realizes he has something to share with him now in his music, and that he has the chance to be a real father to baby Groot. Just another great example of how they're willing to play to a tiny audience. And this instance isn't me. But apparently these guys were the original Guardians of the Galaxy. So like 30 to 40 people got a good cool out of it. And then about the same amount of people recognized Miley Cyrus. So, yeah. I miss you guys so much! And he stole batteries he didn't need. I mean, yeah, win for coming to terms with your issues within the fam, but technically, without the batteries, you'd all still be on Ego the Living Planet. It's beautiful. And so are you, on the inside. Compliments. I think I should call him... Adam. You mean him? I'm both excited and nervous about Infinity War. So many balls in the air, and now you're throwing Warlock into the mix? I do still believe the Russos have it under control. Gotta shout out these dancing credits, and more importantly, this. Go watch this music video. You won't be sorry. Is that the Grandmaster, Jeff Goldblum? 
What's happening? Jeff Goldblum is always a win. I am Groot. I am not boring. You're boring. First, you know tween boring? Groot. Sitting yes, I'll say yes. Second, I guess Chewbacca rules apply? Spend enough time with Groot and you start to understand him? Smart move to have Pratt be able to play off him going forward. That time, I was a Federal Express man. I know I can't take credit for this since all I did was wonder aloud in one of my videos if someone else had a fanfic theory about it. But I'm gonna take credit for predicting this. Still, I don't think he's actually a watcher. You wouldn't need a ride home if he was. I think he's, well, Stan Lee, the all-powerful creator of this universe we've been enjoying. I'm calling it now, when Deadpool 2 comes out, there will be a plethora of articles and reviews with some variation of the title and theme, it just doesn't capture X from the original. Or never quite reach the heights of its predecessor. Or simply, not as good as the first. It's the problem you have when you step out and make something wholly original. And it's very often regardless of content. Critics already have those headlines written for sequels to movies that were praised for being different. I'm telling you, even Empire got that treatment initially. I'm sure you've read and heard that review a hundred times about Volume 2. And I'd like to counter with, first, shut it. Stop writing those reviews. And second, thank you James Gunn for sticking to your vision of the first while also making another uniquely stylized, themed, and colored film. If I had to put one word on the Guardians franchise, it would be irreverence. A reverence to the Hollywood institution and to the summer blockbuster rulebook. And you might have noticed that I gave James Gunn a lot of credit throughout. And that's because he wrote and directed, so most of the success belongs on his shoulders. Sequels often have a difficult time of recapturing the message and tone that made the first one great while not resetting all the characters like a God of War game. Gunn did a great job of building on the relationships instead of just pretending like they all hate each other again, especially opening the film with them as a team fighting together. And for those who feel like they did reset these relationships, how, how, what kind of family do you have where no one disagrees and your personal character flaws all disappear just because you're part of a family? I want nothing to do with it personally, but I'm just curious. The first film was them recognizing they needed a family and slowly learning that working together is better than going it solo. All any of you do is yell at each other. You are not friends. You're right. We're family. Volume 2 is about being in a family and the conflicts that arise. It's about each character overcoming their past grievances like Nebula, and in Rocket's case, it's his own personal issue with his fear of intimacy and unwillingness to accept love. And then obviously Peter's arc with his two dads. You look exactly alike. One's blue! And overcoming the temptation to be a god by putting his true family first. Something that really impressed me about this movie was Gunn's willingness to go back and continue to flesh out those backstories. Often, when you hit the sequels, filmmakers action it up now that the boring story building element's out of the way. That's sarcasm. I get that some of you miss my sarcasm sometimes. But I loved it. The MCU continues to expand, and even the Guardians universe and characters took a more solid shape. As for characters, most everybody got a little more development. Drax less so, but instead he became the group's comedian. He has the most, I don't know, deliberately funny moments, I guess you could call them. The, like, pause for your audience to laugh one-liners. And Batista continues to impress. Kurt Russell really is amazing. There wasn't ever any doubt in my mind that Wyatt Earp could handle a planet-sized role, but I was happy to see him fit right in. They completely changed Groot, which I was worried about on a few levels. Worried they'd undo Volume 1 Groot's sacrifice by giving baby Groot all his memories. But they didn't, so Groot's sacrifice stands, and so does Rocket's sorrow over losing his friend. I was also worried he couldn't live up to adult Groot and would just be a cute puppy the entire film. The crabby puppy's so cute, he makes me wanna die! But baby Groot was a great addition. He combines being the most adorable with also being a self heartless jerk throughout most of the movie. But he also serves a great purpose in the group as the baby that everyone needs to care and look out for. While I did commend Groot in Volume 1, I failed to really sing the praises of Vin Diesel. You can tell a lot of heart went into his lines, as esoteric as they may be. Gunn revealed that for this film, Vin got his own script describing the emotions he's supposed to be conveying in each scene. So props to the Iron Giant. Groot and Rocket were probably my favorite part of the first one, and even though their dynamic has completely changed, somehow they still managed to have some of the funniest moments. I'm Groot. I'm not a raccoon either. I am Groot. Raccoon, whatever. But bar none, the funniest moment in the film for me was Rocket's revelation about why Groot doesn't like hats. I'm Groot. One minute you think someone has a weird shaped head, the next minute it's just because you realize part of that head is the hat. That's why you don't like hats? And while so much of what makes Rocket amazing is Bradley Cooper, I also have to mention the VFX supervisor Chris Townsend and all the video effects studios that were involved in making him look so realistic. I mentioned it a few times throughout, but the CGI and practical are blended together amazingly. Chris Pratt as Star-Lord owns every scene he's in. Even if I'm not LOLing, every time he talks, he'll usually get a smirk out of me. It's just swords were your thing and guns were mine, but I guess we're both doing guns now. I just didn't know that. I meant trash panda. And even Zoe Zaldana had some comedic moments. What was that story you told me about Zardu Hasselfrau? Who? He owned a magic boat. One of the main complaints I've heard and read is that there were too many jokes. I don't know, is that a thing? If they're all funny? What do you expect in an action comedy? An action comedy. A comet action. 
and then you know how I feel about little comedic details. Things like the cable having the caveat or for fun, because these are real goofy people. I believe Peter would write that on there. Or all of Baby Groot's cute waves whenever he's in the background, or dumb little smirks when sitting on someone's shoulder. And one last thing that's a definite win is the severe lack of any, hey, you remember that from the first movie? And they had plenty of opportunities. Instead, they added and improved. Great follow-up to a great start for a great series. So we talked about Wisecrack's Rick and Morty videos, and you should definitely check them out. They just started doing current episode breakdowns a few days after they air, and it's a quick, awesome way to relive and dive into the episode. And not just Rick and Morty, they just did an awesome one for Game of Thrones. Links in the description. Even if you're not a fan of Rick and Morty or Game of Thrones, I know you like Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, and Wisecrack just made their own Earthling Cinema Hidden Meaning video on it. They make amazing positive videos about movies, TV, games, literature, etc. And they have a bunch of really intelligent people writing and making compelling philosophical content. So check that awesomeness out, subscribe, turn on notifications, all that jazz, and tell them I sent you. Lee. My name's Lee. Some of you pointed out that it's strange you've seen my picture but still don't know my name. Picture last week, name this week, next week's social security number. So be sure to tune in. You look like Mary Poppins. Is he cool? Hell yeah, he's cool. I'm Mary Poppins, y'all!